what lies hidden deep within the blue planet? That's a question scientists have been working to answer for many decades. But well, the fact is, we know more about outer space than our own oceans. We have the entire surface of the moon and even Mars mapped, but less than a quarter of the oceans. Now, the ocean covers more than 70% of the Earth's surface. It plays a critical role in supporting life on our planet, from the air we breathe to the food we eat. It's also the largest carbon sink on Earth. And if protected, it's considered by some to be our single best chance of averting the pending climate crisis. Now, plus, there is more life in our oceans than anywhere else. The scientists estimate that there may be up to one million species in the ocean, but two-thirds of them, and possibly more, have yet to be discovered. And while we can attempt to do our part by Googling things you can do to save the oceans, it's difficult to protect what we don't know. So why is so much of the ocean still undiscovered? At the bottom of the sea is very similar to outer space. They're both dark and harsh environments that are difficult to explore. Now take a look at this. It appears quite similar to a spacesuit, but it's actually a diving suit for ocean explorers. It weighs 240 kilograms and is built to withstand the crushing amounts of pressure in the deep ocean for 50 straight hours. But it can only go down to a depth of a little more than 300 meters. Now, it wouldn't get you far into the Mariana Trench. That's the deepest location on Earth, which is about 11 kilometers to the bottom. And consider this, the tallest peak in the world, Mount Everest, is less than nine kilometers above sea level. And while Everest has been scaled by more than 6,000 climbers, only four people have reached the bottom of the Mariana Trench. But of course, sending people to the depth of the ocean isn't the only way we can explore this part of our planet. The scientific and technological advances mean we have a number of tools today that allow us to create a so-called digital ocean. In the end, it's a catch-22. Now, while the benefits of ocean exploration are undeniable, the steep costs mean exploration is deemed too expensive, even as billions of dollars are poured into space missions. The NASA's Perseverance rover mission to Mars alone cost about $3 billion, whereas the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration this year received a budget of $188 million for seafloor mapping and exploration efforts along the U.S. coasts. So as long as funding remains relatively scarce, we will still have a great deal more to learn about our oceans. Experts hope we can do that before it's too late. With so much of our ocean unexplored, it's no surprise that only 7% of the world's oceans are protected. In fact, of that 7%, less than 3% carry the full enforcement and monitoring protections needed to ensure a healthy ocean. But as Julie explained, we have less than a quarter of the ocean mapped. So how can we protect something that we know very little about? Well, to answer that question for us, we are joined now by Dr. Amanda Vincent. She's director and co-founder of Project Seahorse. She's also a professor at the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries at the University of British Columbia. Thank you for joining us today on World Oceans Day, Professor. Uh, earlier, Julie mentioned a mind-blowing fact that we know more about outer space than we know about our oceans. Uh, why, according to you, has so little been explored? Do we have the technology to do it, but we just don't? Yeah, well, that was a fantastic introduction to the ocean, so well done. Let's just add one more fact, which is that 99% of the space on our planet where life is possible lies in the ocean. So it is absolutely central to our existence and very impressive. The problem that you outlined was one of funding and one of research initiatives, but the, the basic problem is one of political will, one of popular momentum. So it's basically our fault because we don't insist that the ocean matters. We don't ask for that support. We don't direct um, decision makers towards the ocean. And so really the easiest thing we can do to get a better understanding of our ocean is vote for ocean issues. And in countries that have the vote, like Singapore, we need to be asking candidates, policymakers, what is your ocean policy? What are you going to do for the ocean? 
And if there is public will behind the ocean, if then there will be political momentum. And then, of course, everything becomes possible. Professor, you have you know, spent a bulk of your career underwater, you know, discovering them tiny, mysterious and extraordinary creatures, seahorses. And apart from the sense of wonder and adventure, how can we benefit from the findings of ocean wildlife and biology? You know, what sort of riches can we expect to uncover if humans manage to explore more of this uh, mysterious frontier? Well, what I love about your question is you dub them ocean wildlife. And that's one of the first challenges often is to convince people that marine fishes, marine invertebrates are wildlife too. Commonly, we talk about the international wildlife trade, and then we talk about fisheries as if they were absolutely detached from each other. But of course, when we fish, we are fishing wildlife. So we need very definitely to ensure that we keep in mind the well-being of populations and ecosystems when we talk about managing our ocean resources. And ocean resources provide food, absolutely, but they also provide a host of other fantastic opportunities for us, whether it's, um, whether it's medicines or whether it's clothing or whether it's minerals or just almost anything we need, we will find some contribution from the ocean, but we have to value the life in it accordingly and actually make an effort to manage our oceans wisely. I very much liked your allusion to marine protected areas. And there is considerable momentum gathering now to try to protect 30% of national waters for each country by 2030. 30 by 30, we're calling it. Because if we can get 30% protected by 2030, that will give us some buffer against the immense experiment we're running at the moment um, fishing our oceans as if there was no tomorrow and extracting without much reflection. So 30% by 2030 is, is the call, and I think a very powerful one. Professor, at the end of last month, we saw reports coming from the Philippines of a scientist who made his way down to the third deepest ocean trench on Earth. He was one of the first humans to ever see it. And he said, you know, he was expecting to find maybe new life forms, creepy crawly things. But instead, he said he saw something that looked like a jellyfish when, in fact, it was plastic. He saw garbage, clothing, a teddy bear. What goes through your mind when you hear that? Well, clearly, I'm dismayed and disappointed, but not surprised. I mean, we do have a lot of rubbish in our ocean and we have a lot of focus on rubbish in our ocean. Problematic and worrying, but by far the biggest pressure on marine biodiversity is mismanaged fisheries. So of course we need to fish, of course we need to extract ocean life, of course that provides income earning opportunities and livelihoods, but we're going to have to do it a lot more responsibly. The single biggest threat to the ocean in an approximate way, I would argue, is bottom trawling. That's when you drop heavily weighted nets on the bottom, you scour the bottom of the ocean, leaving a trail of devastation and damaged habitats, and you extract everything that comes into the net. That is becoming a massive problem. We're not even targeting species anymore in many of these trawl fisheries. We're just going out to grab life itself. So I want you to imagine your favorite hillside, your favorite forest, and helicopters dropping razor wire to shear off absolutely all vegetation at ground level, taking out every bug, bee, bear, butterfly, bush, and then often reducing it to fish meal or fish oil, aquaculture feed, animal feed. This is the devastation, bottom trawling. Hundreds of thousands of trawlers operate all over the world's oceans every day, extracting all life in their path willy-nilly. And by the way, a lot of those trawl fleets are using enslaved labor, and many of them only function because of government subsidies. So plastics, yes, that's worrying, but that's visible. What is invisible to most of us is this devastation wreaked by annihilation fishing or bottom trawling. Probably that's why, I mean, just like climate deniers, there are extinction deniers as well. There are also those who believe that oceans are so vast that it's uh, that their ecosystems are impervious to change. What would you like to say to them, Professor? 
I'd like to say that uh, we have an awful lot of species that have declining populations and are on the IUCN red list of threatened species as being at risk of extinction. And along the way, we've damaged their habitats and damaged our ecosystems. Now, the glory of this is that if you step back and release the pressure, relieve some of the bad fishing methods, get rid of some of the, of the egregious devastation in the ocean, the ocean does have considerable capacity to recover. There is a considerable capacity for populations to resurge and for our resources to stabilize. So the glorious news, because I'm an optimist, is that if we all insist that the ocean is of tremendous importance to us, and Singapore is an island nation, so of course the ocean is, is your backyard, your front yard, and everything else, we insist in the value of the ocean, we can absolutely recover our resources, fish them more sustainably in selective ways, and secure a future for fishers as well as for our food security. Thank you so much. We share your optimism as well. We really appreciate your time today on World Oceans Day. Professor Amanda Vincent, director and co-founder, Project Seahorse Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries, the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada.